Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Office of National Drug Control Policy today for a webinar on innovative approaches for addressing opioid overdose and opioid use disorders in hospital emergency departments. Now, I would like to hand off to our moderator, Peter Gomond. Thank you, Colin. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Emergency departments are a critically important part of our response to the nation's opioid crisis. However, responding effectively can be challenging for emergency departments. Our presenters today have developed some exciting and innovative approaches to doing just that. Dr. Great Tracy Green is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Epidemiology at the Warren Alpert School of Medicine at Brown University, an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Boston University, and Deputy Director of the Boston Medical Center Injury Prevention Center. Dr. Elizabeth Samuels is a postdoctoral fellow in the National Clinician Scholars Program at the Yale University School of Medicine. Until her recent appointment at Yale, uh, Dr. Samuels worked with Dr. Green on the Anchor ED program and she created the LOOP program. She and Dr. Green will co-present present on these programs. Dr. Janice Pringle is an Associate Professor of Pharmacy and Therapeutics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy and the founder of the school's Program Evaluation and Research Unit. Cheryl Andrews is the Executive Director of the Washington County, Pennsylvania Drug and Alcohol Con uh, Commission. She and Dr. Pringle will co-present on the Overdose-Free Pennsylvania Initiative and the Overdose Response in this Initiative Ms. Andrews, Ms. Andrews leads in Washington County, Pennsylvania. And finally, Dr. Gail D'Onofrio is a professor of emergency medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine, where she serves as chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. D'Onofrio will present her work, uh, present on her work addressing opioid use disorders in the emergency department, including buprenorphine induction in the emergency department. We are especially lucky uh, that uh, our panelists are fortunate and grateful that our panelists have agreed uh, to uh, offer informal consultation and technical assistance to uh, emergency departments, to uh, uh, folks working in emergency departments who wish to uh, explore the possibility of developing and implementing similar approaches in their emergency departments provide information on how to request assistance at the end of the webinar. Uh, we will also be posting a recording of the webinar to the ONDCP YouTube channel. Once the recording has been posted, we will email registrants a link to it. And please feel free to share that link with any you know who might be interested. Next slide. Now I uh, have the honor of introducing Michael Botticelli, Director of National Drug Control Policy at the White House. Mr. Botticelli leads the uh, Obama administration's drug policy efforts, which are based on a balanced public health and public safety approach. He is the first person to serve as director of national drug control policy who has a public health and substance use disorder treatment background. He is also the first to hold this title who is openly in recovery. Director Botticelli is a passionate advocate for science-based policy, a champion of efforts to address stigma and misunderstanding, and a powerful voice for recovery. We are fortunate to have him here today, Director Botticelli. Great. Thank you, Peter. And I, too, want to thank our presenters and for all of you being on this very important call today. We'll be talking about a key step on a path toward ending this opioid epidemic, and that's connecting people who have overdosed to treatments so they can find and sustain recovery. I think you all are aware of the numbers that every day 129 people are dying from a drug overdose. And provisional data from the first half of 2015 indicate that number has gone up to 140 people per day. Opioids like pain medication, heroin, and illicit fentanyl are involved in more than half of these deaths. People are being found unresponsive by police, first responders, and loved ones. And we know that they are showing up in our emergency rooms in ever-growing numbers. And many aren't getting the help they need to recover, and we are missing opportunities to intervene and get people into care. I frequently talk with parents and family members who have lost loved ones to overdoses. And I think you know their stories are uh, appearing in the paper and on TV. People write letters to the president to me about their experience with this devastating uh, epidemic. Too many of them have had to wait too long or travel too far to access treatment. Others were never offered a full range of treatment and recovery options, including medication-assisted treatment. One of the things I hear from folks who want to make referrals is a lack of treatment facilities and funding in their communities. 
And that's because right now we have an enormous treatment gap in this country. Only 12% of people who need treatment for substance use disorders are actually getting it. When I was in Toledo earlier this year, I spoke with a local sheriff about how his department is dealing with the surge in overdoses. He said they needed help, but he didn't ask for more officers. He didn't ask for more jail cells to hold more people who are using illicit drugs. He asked for more treatment services. And that's why President Obama has requested $1.1 billion in new funding to expand access to treatment, prevention, and recovery services, especially in areas where they aren't available or are harder to reach, including in many rural areas. So while we work to increase funding, those of you working in emergency departments have a real opportunity for making a difference. I know that there is tremendous pressure on you and that you are often stretched. We need a diverse and comprehensive team to respond effectively, including emergency physicians, first responders, primary care practitioners, addiction specialists, substance use disorder treatment providers, recovery community organizations, and others. And today, you'll hear from people who are doing precisely just that. I was in Providence, Rhode Island last week and visited the Anchor ED program that you'll learn more about today from Drs. Tracy Green and Elizabeth Samuels. This program sends certified peer recovery coaches to emergency departments to help overdose and opioid use disorder patients find recovery. You'll also hear from Dr. Janice Pringle and Cheryl Anderson about the great work they're doing in Pennsylvania, and from Dr. Gail D'Onofrio for her study and research on buprenorphine induction in the emergency department. All of these initiatives have promise, and while there are several other examples worth lifting up, we only have a little bit of time today. The point is that we're learning a lot about linking people to treatment, and we need to apply this knowledge so that we can continue to save lives. We need the medical community to, to lean in on this if we are ever going to turn this crisis around. And we need to break the stigma associated with substance use disorders and the related stigma associated with medication-assisted treatment so more people can access evidence-based treatment and get their lives back. Ending this epidemic and reducing the spread of this disease will take everyone working together, from the President of the United States to Congress, our state leaders, local city council members, medical professionals, and our law enforcement officers, and each of you watching this webinar today. As, a, as you're listening, I encourage you to think about what more you can do to connect overdose patients to treatment and, by extension, move our country from crisis to recovery. Today's discussion doesn't end here, though. You'll receive information how to, on how to request informal consultation from all the experts I mentioned to help you along the way, and I want to thank you for that generous offer. Thank you for being engaged and committed to make a difference. I challenge you to do your part to help people get treatment and find recovery, and I look forward to continuing to work together to do just that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Director Botticelli. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Tracy Green and Dr. Elizabeth Samuels will now present on the Anchor ED and Loop programs. Dr. Green? Thanks, Peter, and thank you, Director Botticelli. Today we'd like to talk with you about emergency department-initiated responses in the state of Rhode Island. Next slide. We'll cover trends and the context of the innovations, share about two programs, Anchor ED and Loop, and preview some next steps. Next slide. Since 2001, we've seen a dramatic shift in the state's overdose epidemic, with prescription medication-based overdoses declining and illicit drugs, especially fentanyl-related overdoses, increasing 250 percent since 2011. These disturbing trends and deaths are just the tip of the iceberg, though, with non-fatal overdoses and emergency department visits also skyrocketing. So what can be done? Next slide. Well, one evidence-based intervention that the state has scaled up is access to naloxone in the community. By differentiating naloxone access points to the many at-risk populations in a range of community settings, providing naloxone is emerging as the standard of prevention of future overdose. In doing so, Rhode Island is reaching a target range estimated by demographers to reduce community overdose mortality. As you can see, the emergency department comprises an important 9% of the total distribution for last year alone. The best predictor of a future overdose is a past one. But what can we do, but can we do more to sustain life, reduce harm, and promote recovery? Next slide. Yes, we think we can. Recognizing the chance for a reachable moment, a pilot program coupled the training and provision of naloxone with the opportunity to link overdose survivors to certified peer recovery specialists. 
The pilot for the Anchor ED program, as it's called, began in June 2014 and provided peer recovery supports on weekends to a small number of emergency departments. This grew and expanded after successful piloting to provision of now 24-7 certified peer recovery services in every hospital ED in the state. All recovery coaches are trained in overdose prevention, naloxone administration, receive standardized curriculum on peer recovery supports and coaching, and have a strong harm reduction and medication-assisted treatment orientation. So here's how it works. Upon arrival to the ED, the patients offered the peer recovery coach services, and if they consent to receive them, the peer is paged to arrive within 30 minutes at the bedside. They then meet with the patient or family, if they wish, prior to discharge, gather an understanding of recovery supports and resource needs, treatment, housing, etc., and educate on naloxone. Post-discharge, they continue providing supports up to 90 days, since what people may want or think they want or need may change after leaving the ED. This effort started with the support of SAMHSA's block grant funds and is increasingly being billed to insurance, which promotes sustainability. Next slide. Here are some data from 2016 reports of the Anchor ED program showing the distribution of treatment and recovery services provided to patients and tracking the number of peer recovery coach visits to the EDs. Currently, about 50% of patients continue to receive treatment or recovery services post-discharge. The program also appears to be reaching a diverse range of individuals, the majority of whom have not been in treatment recently. These data are also being reported publicly, transparently, on preventoverdosri.org. But what about people who refuse transport to the ED or who refuse peer recovery supports while in the ED? Next slide. Well, Rhode Island Emergency Medical Services further innovated on this program and introduced a new partnership this past June, where the same peer recovery support services are offered in the field at the time of the overdose reversal by EMS, thereby opening the window of opportunity earlier for connecting to peer supports. The fact is, we don't know when is the right time, when someone wants help and support after an overdose emergency, but we can ask and offer and allow them the dignity and respect to choose when and what is right for them. Next slide. This is what EMS inputs into their system to track naloxone administration prior to their arrival and also to offer peer recovery support services. Both of these are required reporting fields. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Samuels to hear about the next innovation. Thank you, Tracy. So the program that we implemented in the Lifespan Hospital System, the Lifespan Opioid Overdose Prevention Program, was born out of a collaboration that occurred at the Rhode Island Department of Health Drug Overdose Prevention and Rescue Coalition. And this was a true collaboration between Lifespan Emergency Department physicians, pharmacists, the Anchor ED program, and the Rhode Island Department of Behavioral Health Care. We developed a protocol that would be easy to implement at any hospital, regardless of existing infrastructure for addiction treatment. Next slide. The program we implemented had three major goals. First, we to, to reduce overdose deaths. First, by increasing access to naloxone for overdose rescue, expanding ED overdose prevention education and addiction counseling, and finally, increasing ED referral to addiction treatment, perhaps the most important of these three. Next slide. The program has three components. Overdose prevention and response education through video and handout educational tools, take home intranasal naloxone, and consultation with one of the Anchor ED peer recovery coaches for recovery support and navigation. These services are offered to anyone with an identified opioid dependency, also polysubstance use, but I would say it is most commonly utilized by our emergency providers for patients who present specifically after an opioid overdose. Next slide. Our program, and I would say it's important for any program that is developed, is integrated into usual practice within the emergency department. The naloxone rescue kit is assembled by pharmacy and stored in the emergency department medication dispensary, just like any other medication. The provider orders the naloxone rescue kit in our electronic medical record system. We have EPIC. And the kit is retrieved from the dispensary by the nurse and given to the patient, who also helps set up an educational video or the, and or the patient provides, um, patient is given in-person education with the recovery coach. Next slide. This is a screenshot of the order set that we have in EPIC, um, illustrating what it would look like when the provider orders the coach consultation as well as the overdose education video and the rescue kit. Next slide. 
Patient education can take various forms. Now, we use in-person education predominantly with the recovery coach, which is the gold standard. It allows for opportunity for treatment referral and facilitates out-of-ED treatment, out-of-ED follow-up, as well as referral to treatment. There are many educational videos available if in-person education is not possible for your institution. Uh, Prescribetoprevent.org has a wealth of resources that you can use. Our naloxone kits also include a written and pictorial ins and instructions for how to use the intranasal naloxone in English and in Spanish. Next slide. In addition to assessing for readiness for engagement in treatment and screening for risk factors for HIV and hepatitis C transmission, all education should at a minimum include discussing risk factors for overdose, how to avoid an overdose, and how to recognize and respond to an overdose. Next slide. So you set up a program. The question is, will your emergency providers and nurses even use it? You will definitely need to do provider and nurse education and engagement to get them on board. And you should expect to meet some reluctance. Having a local champion at your institution is extremely helpful for successful implementation and help disseminating the evidence that already supports these types of interventions in the emergency department. Preliminary evaluation immediately following the implementation of the LOOP program in our emergency departments actually did show some significant provider uptake of giving patients take home naloxone and consulting recovery coaches. These data are for patients discharged after an opioid overdose in the first two months immediately following program implementation and during the initial recovery coach trial period when they were only available on the weekends. It has since become standard of care to send patients home with an naloxone rescue kit and to, and to consult a recovery coach. Next slide. One concern many emergency department providers and directors have is whether providing these types of services will increase duration of stay in the emergency department. This table looks at, compares median length of stay in the emergency department among patients who are discharged from the emergency department uh, after an opioid overdose. Uh, the x-axis shows the number of loop services utilized, whether they got a naloxone kit, a video, a recovery coach, those being the three elements. And as you can see, there's no difference in median length of stay. Next slide. Important factors to consider when setting up a similar program in your hospital are the means of distribution, what kind of naloxone are you going to give out, cost, how are you going to pay for it, policies and regulations impacting program implementation, and program utilization and evaluation. Next slide. There are several types of naloxone that you can distribute. There are the more recently FDA approved intranasal naloxone and FZO, which is an IM injection. Both are somewhat expensive, but very user-friendly and easy to use. The recent FDA-approved intranasal naloxone has a higher dose, which may be more effective if you are in an area where there is significant fentanyl in the local opiate supply. You can also use the lower lock intranasal naloxone or intramuscular, which have been used in community settings since 1996. Depending on your state's regulations, you can give the naloxone directly to the patient to take home, provide an outpatient prescription, or refer your patients to a community organization or pharmacy with naloxone standing orders. Your hospital or ED pharmacist is a key partner in establishing whatever distribution protocol um, you're able to develop. Next slide. The regulations impacting access and liability are state dependent. There are several types of policies and regulations you will need to consider, including legislative and pharmacy regulations on direct provider to patient distribution, third party prescribing, and Good Samaritan laws. An excellent resource to find out your state's regulations is www.lawatlas.org. Next slide. This is an example of one of the maps that is easily generated at lawatlas.org. The states in yellow have legislation that allows for third-party naloxone prescribing, meaning you could prescribe naloxone to one person who may use it on someone else, such as a parent that may have a child with opioid dependency. Next slide. Our discussion would not be complete without considering cost. The cost of naloxone varies, and in some areas it is becoming significantly more expensive. Some hospitals have special purchasing agreements 
So check to see if your hospital has one. It may make naloxone more affordable for you. Some emergency departments who give patients take-home naloxone are funded through partnerships with local or state departments of health. Our program at, in Rhode Island is generously funded by our administrators as a community service. Grants are also an option, although these are time limited, often to um, a duration of a study or whatever the lifetime of the grant is. And in some places, programs have figured out how to reimburse for kits and patient education via insurance. I'm going to hand it back to Tracy. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. So in terms of next steps, and based on the successful loop efforts in the ED workflow, we saw an opportunity for other hospital departments to use best practice advisories in an EMR to promote and tailor opioid safety and naloxone recommendations and improve the standardization of substance use disorder treatment in the hospital and ED. This is an example algorithm applied to the trauma services at Rhode Island Hospital as part of the pilot study. Next slide. In this case, the best practice advisory recommends naloxone based on medications the patient is being discharged home with and indications from the patient's EMR. It displays those indicators for the prescriber and includes suggested orders as well as practical information like preferred pharmacy for pickup of naloxone. Next slide. Next steps accompanying these innovations also involve using tools such as this recovery planning tool card in conversations with patients prior to discharge from the ED and offering to initiate medication-assisted treatment prior to discharge from the hospital or ED. The Perry and Goldner Discharge Planning Law, signed by Governor Raimondo last month, compels Rhode Island hospitals to institute comprehensive discharge planning and information sharing with patients who are transitioning from hospitals. Next slide. But efforts to better link patients to treatment and expand MAT in the ED and hospital setting, inspired by data from Dr. D'Onofrio's study that you'll hear about soon, require adequate resourcing and treatment capacity in the post-discharge. To tackle the lack of capacity, especially for buprenorphine treatment, Rhode Island is investing in the creation of centers of excellence in MAT to encourage hospitals and other community providers to become more of the solution to the opioid epidemic by applying to become a center of excellence. These centers will exist to initiate, stabilize, or restabilize patients on MAT, then transition them to community care. The first center is set to open by the end of this year. Next slide. The sum total of these innovations builds to a new standard of care for substance use disorder in Rhode Island hospitals. And public comment is being sought on the proposed voluntary designation levels for hospitals that you see before you, which sets a base level of care for addiction and overdose. That's level three. The levels incorporate components of the programs and policies you've just heard about and build to more expansive capacities, such as hospital-affiliated centers of excellence and MAT in that level one. Next slide. So in summary, there is a need to increase the baseline standard of care for patients with substance use problems across the hospital and ED settings. While there are many missed opportunities, there's huge potential for benefit. ED community partnerships are feasible and effective with little cost to hospitals. And when implementing these efforts, it's important to focus on patient opioid safety and extend services that are recovery focused and harm reduction oriented, like naloxone and syringe access. Finally, access to MAT providers is critical to hospitals creating and maintaining a high standard of care for overdose and addiction if we are able to shift to the epidemic curve. Thank you so much, and we look forward to supporting your technical assistance needs and contributing to a larger practice community on this topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Green and Dr. Samuels. And now uh, Dr. Janice Pringle uh, and Cheryl Andrews will present on their work in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Peter and Director Botticelli. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about three programs we're leading at Peru. The first is a website resource. The next is a technical assistance center to communicate to communities within Pennsylvania that is supported by this website. The third is a program we implemented within a local ED that was conceived as a potential strategy for reducing overdose risk among a community population. We will discuss some of the results we recently obtained from evaluating this ED-based program. Next slide. 
The OverdoseFreePA.org website was conceived as an online town square for providing overdose-related information to communities throughout Pennsylvania. The website was designed by the various users, including substance use disorder treatment providers, SUD payers, SUD policymakers, members of the criminal justice system, educators, family members of persons who have overdosed, and persons in recovery, among others. The website contains curricula, ways that persons can access SUD treatment, the latest regional and national curated information regarding overdose prevention intervention strategies or data, important public domain information such as prescribing guidelines and program protocols, lists of potential speakers and resources communities can use, among other resources. Each community can have their own web page with their own information as they design it. Next slide, please. We are very proud of the increasing number of communities who are providing their mortality data to us so that we can apply a process to clean that data and provide the data back to these communities as real time as possible. We've made the death data they provide searchable by date of death, age, gender, location of death, residence, and drugs involved in the death. The protocol we are using to clean the data permits the data to be more accurate than is the case currently by the potential of drugs that were involved in the death. This protocol was developed by our local medical examiner, Dr. Carl Williams. We believe that communities must have the most accurate, searchable, and up-to-date information in order to develop effective plans that can impact overdose deaths. Next slide. The website also links users to our new Pennsylvania Heroin Overdose Prevention Technical Assistance Center. At this point, we have close to 40% of all the communities or counties signed up to take some part of the center. Next slide, please. The Technical Assistance Center, or TAC, provides comprehensive training to any community who signs up and an opportunity to access intensive technical assistance or technical assistance on an as-needed basis. Next slide, please. The TAC is based upon three evidence-based models. First, the strategic prevention framework. Second, a systems transformational framework that we've developed here that supports the development of healthy coalitions that can work effectively to continuously learn how to improve their efforts to reduce overdose deaths within their community. And third, the Institute of Medicine's intervention protractor. Next slide, please. From these three models, we have developed a framework that steps a community through the process of understanding more fully their overdose problem, building an effective coalition, developing a strategic plan, developing an impact model, developing an ongoing evaluation plan that helps the community continuously adapt to changing conditions within their community and learn how to improve in their efforts to reduce overdoses and ways of obtaining funding for their efforts. The website contains numerous worksheets and informational sheets that communities and coalitions can use to step through the framework process and organize themselves towards being effective. We firmly believe that 20% of the way communities can learn to impact overdose deaths successfully is what they do, while 80% of the way they can be effective is how they do things. We put as much emphasis on the how, if not more, than the what when, the, when we train and support communities in their work. Next slide, please. The TAC will expand information we provide to include help in improving naloxone availability, ways of expanding medication-assisted treatment and SUD treatment availability. We are developing a calculator that will help each community understand how much treatment they will need of a certain quality in order to bend the curve in terms of their overdose deaths. And eventually, we want to help the communities develop real-time treatment finders. It will also improve, help them improve their PDMP, prescription drug monitoring, uh, utilization, change opioid prescribing practices, increase their drug take-back programs, and increase the use of SBIRT programs in places such as EDs, among other strategies. We are also including ways communities can enhance the identification of patients with Hep C and how to use recovery support or patient navigators in settings such as EDs. Next slide, please.
And speaking of EDs, we recently completed a program, an evaluation of that program within an ED that was called Project Safe Landing. This program involved the implementation of expert services within an ED as a potential way a community can reduce overdose risk. This ED received no additional funding. Allegheny General um, Health System ED was the ED that was involved, and it used our system's transformational framework to guide its implementation. The ED did reach a steady state of implementation where it was screening and providing brief interventions at a rate similar to EDs nationally that had received considerable funding to implement ESPER. We looked at whether we could Im implement ESPER with limited funding and whether the application of ESPER impacted downstream healthcare costs and readmissions. Both of these latter outcomes are ones that both payers and hospitals are interested in and could enhance their support of implementing ESPER type programs in EDs. Next slide, please. Using a control ED and two time frames, so there was essentially three controls and a statistical method involving propensity score matching conducted by Arnie Aldrich at RTI, we found, next slide, please, that the expert implementation was associated with a 21% reduction in downstream healthcare costs and significantly reduced readmissions one year post implementation. This suggests that the implementation of ESPER using a framework such as the one we are using would likely result in more patients being identified as needing SUD treatment and also outcomes that are attractive financially to payers and hospital providers. This project has now added more intensive, warm handoffs to patients that need SUD treatment to enhance the number and effectiveness of SUD treatment referrals. The program is also now providing take-home naloxone to patients who have overdosed. The Pennsylvania Medical, our Medicaid Medical Director, Dr. David Kelly, who was involved with this program, is looking at ways this program expanded to other EDs throughout the, uh, Pennsylvania. Next slide. If you want to learn more about the programs that I've mentioned, here are the links. I'd like to also acknowledge our funders, the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, um, SAMHSA, um, who funded um, some of the support that was provided to the ED on our part, not to the ED specifically, uh, the Staunton Farm Foundation and the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce my Pennsylvania co-presenter, Cheryl Andrews, who's the Executive Director of the Washington County Drug and Alcohol Commission. Thank you, Jan. Washington Drug and Alcohol Commission is an independent nonprofit corporation serving as the single county authority for Washington County. Next slide. Washington County made national news last August when eight overdoses occurred within 70 minutes. Since August of last year, Washington County 911 has responded to 336 overdose calls. Washington County now has 89% of first responders trained and carrying naloxone. Next slide. What is a warm handoff? The State Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs has issued a mandate to the single county authorities to ensure that overdose survivors are offered 24-7 services that will provide a direct referral from the hospital emergency department to treatment. While we completely agree that a warm handoff is vital, we have found that implementation can be challenging. Next slide. Why do we need a handoff? The risk of death from an overdose increases significantly with each non-fatal overdose experience. Secondly, withdrawal. Opiate addicts often behave in desperate and criminal ways to continue to use their drug of choice well after the euphoric benefit of using has severely diminished. We would ask why. Well, the answer is the withdrawal symptoms they experience, commonly referred to as being dope sick, are so physically painful that they literally do anything to avoid it. So keep in mind that being revived with naloxone initiates a very swift and immediate onset of withdrawal, the very place they don't want to be. And third, if the door-to-door -door treatment does not occur, the likelihood is that the survivor will not otherwise enter treatment. There is a window of opportunity that, if missed, may not come about again until another life-altering event occurs, such as another overdose 
or a brush with the law. Next slide. So this is the protocol for Washington County. We want everyone to call 911. The first responder arrives at the scene, and about the same time that the dispatch call goes out, the County Office of Public Safety generates an email alert to the SCA, that's me, the single county authority and the district attorney of a suspected overdose. No personal identification information is released. This alerts the single county authority of a possible transport to the hospital and we can begin putting our on-call people into motion. We also have a professional 24-7 crisis line that may be utilized in order to provide phone intervention with a patient if they are refusing transport. However, the first responders know that the ultimate goal is to transport the survivor to the hospital. Next slide. Once in the emergency department, the hospital staff will call the 24-7 crisis line. The SCA supervisor who receives the call assesses the situation. Various factors determine if an on-call worker will be dispatched to the emergency department. When the worker does arrive in the emergency department, a screening and a bed search begins immediately. Depending on the time of day, the dedicated hospital case manager or certified recovery specialist may already be working at the hospital and can respond to the patient. Timing is everything. That is why the SCA now has embedded case managers and certified recovery specialists within the hospital to have coverage from 8.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. Bed availability at both the hospital and the treatment provider, as well as having an ample amount of time to coordinate, are key factors in being able to make a door-to-door -door transfer. The SCA has also entered into a contractual agreement with the local ambulance and chair service in order to provide transportation to the treatment provider. Next slide. What happens when there's no beds available? Many times this is the case. The positive side of this scenario is that the patient did go to the ED and in doing so now has made a connection with the single county authority who can help navigate the system with them. The SCA will continue to monitor this individual until there is full access to treatment, which may include MAT or medication-assisted treatment. If no bed, then the on-call worker will immediately assure that the individual has a safe place to go following discharge from the hospital, and the worker will begin to map out next steps, such as an appointment at our office, the community supports that are necessary, recovery meetings, connecting with a recovery peer as well. We currently have coordinated next-day Suboxone protocols, and the SCA is working diligently with a doctor to develop a 24-7 protocol so patients may begin outpatient Suboxone treatment no matter what time the individual presents in the emergency department. Assuredly, the SCA worker will meet daily with the patient until admission into treatment occurs. Next slide. Many overdose survivors do refuse transport Oh, um, yes, do refuse transport into, um, to the hospital. So we're developing strategies to address this. EMS and first responders ha have information to distribute to the patient at the scene on how to access help. First responders may also utilize the 24-7 crisis line to ask for an intervention with the patient at the scene. The county EMS medical director would like to begin training to all first responders. The model to be used is called the Connect Community Paramedics Program, which includes motivational interviewing components that would encourage individuals to seek the help that they need. We are looking to develop crisis diversion behavioral health centers that would also be licensed as detox centers to serve the overdose survivors and those in need of detox. These centers would allow us a greater window of time to access um, services that our people need. We want to continue to educate our state and federal legislators and clearly define our needs so that we can accomplish a seamless warm handoff, as well as communicate at the state level departments and bureaus in order to develop statewide protocols that would address warm handoff. Next slide. There are many challenges with developing a warm handoff protocol, but we must embrace every opportunity to bring all players to the table. In doing so, we will continue to educate, which organically begins to reduce the stigma that is so often associated with substance use disorders. 
lines of communication need to remain open and clear to assure that the very laws intended to protect a patient's rights are not the same laws that prohibit them from achieving wellness and long-term recovery. Finally, let's look at overdose survivors as people who deserve the opportunity to get well. This is done when we marry public health and public safety and take a full focus approach to the public health epidemic. Next slide. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you today, and I will now turn it back over to Peter. Thank you. Well, th well thank you, Director Andrews, and thank you, Dr. Pringle, for a fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, presentation. And now Dr. Gail D'Onofrio will tell us about the exciting work that she is doing uh, at uh, Yale New Haven Medical Center, uh, which includes buprenorphine in induction in the emergency department. Dr. D'Onofrio? Uh, hello and good afternoon. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about innovative interventions that can be done in the ED that actually save lives. Um, next slide. So as we've been talking about this morning, I'm sure everybody knows this escalating um, public health problem. Multiple people um, has, has been seen in 2014 that have substance use disorder, many of which you've just heard about, only 12% getting into treatment. EED has seen a market increase in this, going from 145,000 to 420,000 from 2004 to 2012. Um, for um, our work, and some that's already been presented this morning, you could see that the only options for ED providers were just including a referral. Since 2002, we have had the ability to use the initiation of buprenorphine and a subsequent use of waters, and we have not done that till very recently. I will talk a little bit about the study that we um, published regarding ED-initiated buprenorphine and the fact that we're trying to change the paradigm so that as EDs often initiate treatment for acute or uh, chronic medical conditions or exacerbations such as diabetes or hypertension or asthma, and then do this warm handoff, we can e do this um, with addiction as well. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, next slide. So as you know, overdoses have happened for a lot, and I won't belabor this, um, with more than 120 happening per day. Next slide, please. Um, and so why the ED? Um, and that's, again, one of our themes for today, and that's really where the patients are. We found that the majority of patients with opioid use disorders use the ED as their primary source of care, and so it is a great opportunity to obviously identify patients and then to offer treatment and referral. Next slide, please. So this is a typical case, a uh, real case. A uh, 22-year-old female presents to the emergency department in a private vehicle driven by friends. On arrival, she's pulled out, out of her vehicle by her friends. The ED staff get there. She's unresponsive. She has a low saturation. Um, obviously, we're starting um, ambuing her and, um, and ventilation and uh, inserting an MV and gave her naloxone. Uh, she responds and she wakes up and uh, tells us that two weeks prior to that, she switched from prescription drugs to IV heroin. So my question to everybody is really why is this different than any other acute emergency? Um, next slide. What we have traditionally done for these patients is uh, observe them, and often you'll hear the emergency physician saying, great, it was heroin, it's a quick acting drug, we only need to watch it for six hours, and then we can go. As opposed to methadone, in which case may require um, admission. But why is that the case? If a woman had presented, and perhaps in cardiac arrest, uh, maybe in that age group, she could have um, a long QT interval or whatever. We defibrillate her. She's back. We don't say, gee, great, nice save. Um, here's a pamphlet. Uh, here's a bunch of cardiologists you might be able to go to, and good luck to you. So as ridiculous as that seems, that's what we appear to be doing with patients who present with a life-threatening um, illness. Um, and we know that if they do present with an overdose, that they are much more likely to present with another overdose and die. So we have to come up with what are these new things that we can be doing. Next slide. 
So why not initiate treatment immediately in the emergency department? Next slide. And so what do I mean by that? First of all, we saved the life initially, and that was our emergent care processes. We um, administered the loxine even in the field or here. We monitored them um, for a while. We may have offered supplemental oxygen. We may be involved in um, acute precipitating acute withdrawal and having to treat that. Um, patients may be vomiting and we may need to treat that. Um, but whatever, we do those emergency care processes and we have saved a life. But after that, we have to save the life again. And uh, how, I'll just, what do we mean by that? Well, our interventions can be uh, multifaceted, as you've heard from the speakers before me. The first thing that we do is um, we initiate a conversation, and I'll talk about that. All of our doctors, all of our residents have been trained in brief intervention, and particularly what we use the brief negotiation interview, which has some MI associated with it, or we have a project of start, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this brief negotiation interview is immediately um, offered once the patient is capable of listening, um, and we don't ask their permission, we just initiate the conversation. There's also harm reduction, I think you've heard a lot about naloxone, um, so that is uh, giving a prescription, giving out naloxone, whatever it is, and the education surrounding that offering advice, which could just be, um, again, in New Haven, we had very recently a very bad outbreak with um, 18 patients presenting over a very short period of time. Um, they thought they were getting cocaine, but in effect, they were getting fentanyl. So we had multiple, multiple deaths. As a result, we have talked to all of our patients who come in, individuals with addiction, to make sure that they understand that what they may be using may be fentanyl, and maybe they need to use a little bit um, at a time before they use the whole amount and other harm reduction uh, techniques. In addition to all this, we can offer pharmacological treatment, um, that being with buprenorphine, and we do a very um, warm handoff with our multiple sites. Um, and after the good thing about uh, what happened to us just recently is that all of our uh, opiate treatment programs and our federally funded health centers, et cetera, really open their doors to us, and so we now have a lot more slots available for buprenorphine if we do refer, and we have an elaborate protocol. If we have time, I can tell you about that. So next slide. So um, we have two um, kind of processes, and this is how I feel about substance use in general, is that um, all of our doctors um, understand how to screen all of our doctors, know how to give an intervention, uh, um, psychosocial intervention, and all of our doctors actually do know how to refer patients. But it gets very crazy in the emergency department, and it's really very helpful um, if we have people who can help with this. And we have had Project Assert for 16 years um, so far. And this is um, a, a program where we have community health workers that are employed by the hospital. We, we right now have four. You can see their pictures right now. Um, and these individuals um, do less screening because, quite truthfully, they're always called for more of the uh, severe end of the spectrum. They will go in to see all of our patients. We particularly say to our staff that we don't ask them if they want to see this person. This person just shows up in the room and introduces themselves, and they themselves tell them who they are and um, would they mind having a conversation around the drug use. We have never had anyone say no. They may not want to um, get the referral that day, but they don't ever say no to the conversation when we actually have part of the BNI and ask them directly, um, uh, my name is, say, for example, Dr. Janafrio, would you mind if I spend a few minutes talking about your opiate use? Um, we have progressively seen more people. You can see on the bottom right-hand side in our community with opiate heroin use and referrals, which is um, almost the same or almost slightly eclipsing cocaine, which we had had more of a problem with previously. So these um, individuals um, intervene. They can do harm reduction if that's possible. If they don't want to receive the referral right now, they have a, a lot they can talk about. And then they directly link them. And um, next slide. So we know that this is just our last year data. We're always one year behind. So um, our last year data was that we found 
um, that the majority of patients, when they are directly um, referred from our hospital, 72% of them successfully enrolled in a program with month, one month. Many people ask me what is success from the ED, what can we expect to do, and the, what we expect to do from the ED is to increase access to care, um, and that's it. I can't do much once the patients get there and responsible for what happens um, when they are in a treatment program, but what we are doing is accessing, uh, opening up that access to care. So this process in its own, which is um, actually just intervening and doing a really direct handoff. They actually call the um, insurance company if the person has one, gets um, the okay for referral to a variety of number of places, or we have places where people can go who are on Medicaid or are part of our health state system. Uh, next slide. And the last thing was the study regarding um, buprenorphine. People were randomized who were uh, moderate to severe opiate use disorder patients into just referral, which meant it wasn't just referral. They were told based on their insurance where they could go. If they um, were in the second category, it was basically just as I described to you, our project assert model. And the third model was we would do the intervention as well, but also initiate buprenorphine in the emergency department follow up with primary care for 10 weeks of treatment. We enrolled 329 patients, and next slide. And the bottom line of the um, results were that in the buprenorphine group, we had almost 80% of our patients who were sent there were enrolled at 30 days. Um, in the second group, which is the Project Assert group, which is not horrible, those people we had about 48% were enrolled in treatment, and we had almost 38% in the referral group. Again, the referral group is not a standard referral group. That's somebody who was given a phone right there. They were told where they would go based on their insurance. We also found that seven-day illicit opiate use was um, significantly less in the buprenorphine group than it was in both the referral or in the brief intervention group. Next slide, please. So lessons learned from this is that it was feasible to screen and provide ED-initiated BNIs and buprenorphine during the course of an ED visit. Um, the majority of our patients were seen uh, identified by screening. Uh, screening about 9% were overdoses, and um, another uh, maybe a third, um, a little bit less than that, were people who came in seeking treatment. Um, Project Assert is very helpful in that they can assist with facilitated warm handoffs to, and they know everything about our community treatment programs and our office-based providers. Um, we were able to um, offer that buprenorphine, and people did link up to that case, to that office-based care. And our ED physicians were willing to participate in prescribing bup. Right now, we have 15 doctors who have waivers in emergency departments, all doctors are capable of giving out one dose, but you need to have a waiver to order to prescribe. Some of these challenges can be met in that, as you know, buprenorphine is a uh, class three drug, which means that um, anyone else, they could call me or anybody on, uh, we have a variety of people of our administrators who want to call and we could send in the script uh, for the patient if uh, we were not directly there. So we have now set up all these protocols with different um, systems, and uh, it's just important that everybody follows those protocols. Um, and if you, if we have a second, just go to the next slide and the next, and this is our um, buprenorphine referral form. And so when a doctor actually decides to go ahead and start someone, they have to be sure that in fact they are severe and uh, opiate use disorder person, so they do a quick uh, DSM. Um, this was or mini skid um, for dependents to make sure that they have a score of less than three. I mean, greater than three, it's really important because in that other area where we had the cocaine patients coming in with uh, what they thought was cocaine and it was an opiate overdose, we don't want to be starting people on um, Suboxone. We make sure they have a positive urine. We make sure that their liver function tests are less than five times normal. And we make sure that they are weighing withdrawal so that they have a college score of at least 10 or 12 and then we can start initiating it. If we don't initiate it there, we can give a take-home. 
really will do that for up to 96 um, hours. And we have a place that we send them, and this is just examples of places that we send them to, and depending on whether they're on EPIC or not, they get an EPIC um, uh, notice that the person's coming at such and such time. If they don't, we fax this to them, and uh, we set up a dime when they will be there. So we've been able to do this. In addition, these patients are all linked up with our follow-up nurses. Um, and hopefully we'll have a link in there um, for Project Assert. So they're all followed up to make sure that the, the loop was closed. Um, so I think I'll start stop there, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. D'Onofrio, and, and thank you to all of our presenters. These uh, presentations were, uh, were truly, uh, truly uh, inspiring. There is a lot that can be done. Uh, can we have our last slide, please? So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, our presenters and some other experts in the field who couldn't join us today uh, were kind enough uh, to make themselves available uh, for technical assistance. Um, I am seeing a, uh, the, Dr. D'Onofrio's last slide. Uh, we need one more slide if that's available. Um, and uh, uh, we and we have uh, worked worked out a system with them. Our presenters will. Um, uh, or actually, what you can do is email us, ONDCP, at this address, recovery, RSVP, at ondcp.eop.gov. If you are interested in uh, requesting uh, assistance in uh, how to uh, implement similar in your emergency department, uh, you may also send questions uh, uh, to that email address as well, and we will route them uh, to uh, the uh, experts who have volunteered to help us. Uh, Dr. Green will be coordinating that effort, and so we will send your requests to her, and uh, then she will reach out to the various, uh, various uh, parties who have requested assistance. Uh, with, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to once again thank our presenters. This is really exciting work. We're very gratified for the uh, uh, strong uh, interest in this session today. Uh, and we will be posting this as a recording uh, in the near future, and we'll email you with the link for that. And that concludes our webinar today on innovative approaches for addressing opioid overdose and opioid use disorders in hospital emergency departments. Thank you.